Today I want to talk to you about biblical literacy and spiritual literacy, okay? And we're going to skip, I think, the first slide where I talk about Matthew 24 for the sake of time because that will cause me to have a rabbit trail. I want to talk to you about biblical literacy and this generation of teenagers, let's not assume that they're biblically literate, right? Let's not assume that they know about Noah. Let's not assume that they know about Moses and the burning bush. Let's not even assume that they know about Jesus. It's not enough to open up the Bible and talk because, oh, geez, I've got to be careful because I know you don't know me. Because when the Bible's, the gospel is enough when it's preached in context. If it's not preached in context, we can actually cause people to, um, to shrivel up spiritually and die. What do I mean? So the, the people who were responsible for betraying and murdering Jesus, remember they devoted their entire life to biblical literacy. But they confused the prophecies of the first coming of the Messiah with the prophecies of the second coming of the Messiah. And what happens when you do that? What happens when you value the Word of God out of context? Well, when the Word becomes flesh and makes His dwelling among us, rather than honoring Him, you kill Him. So the gospel is enough when it's preached in context. The gospel is not enough because we know that the evil one used the gospel because the gospel is not just John 3.16, it's Genesis to Revelation, right? The, the evil one used the gospel out of context to try to lure Jesus away from God's purpose. So to say, it's just, let's just get into the word. No, let's get into the word in context. So biblical literacy is closely tied to spiritual literacy. When I say biblical literacy, I'm not saying um, let's make sure they have John 3.16 memorized. I'm saying let's make sure that we understand the pattern worth emulating is this, that we study to show ourselves approved and we know the Word of God inside and out. And some of you may think, you know what, hey, I'm bivocational, I'm volunteer, I don't, I don't have time. And we all know, for those of you that are not, bivocational or volunteer, just because you get paid to work full-time doesn't mean you have more time, right? We're all, we're all, we all have the same issue. We don't have enough time. So that requires us to just say yes to what God asks us to say yes to. One of the most important things you can say yes to is to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. And the key to doing that is to have spiritual lit literacy as well. So, I want to talk to you about biblical literacy and spiritual literacy today. Have you ever wondered how God, who doesn't change, negotiates change? Have you ever wondered why God, who doesn't change, created a world that constantly changes? And how does God handle that? For a lot of us, it seems like change is really hard. But change is very much related to biblical literacy. There are over 9,000 different systems, definitions, philosophies, and pedagogies of leadership. So if I stand up here and say, everything rises and falls on leadership, which 9,000 versions? So we need to lean into information and opportunity because information, the information you have access to and the opportunity you have access to has a huge impact on how biblical literacy plays a role in your youth ministry. What do I mean? Well, I just talked about the 9,000 definitions of leadership. If we're not careful, we can educate ourselves beyond obedience. Sometimes God asks us to do stuff that makes no sense. Sometimes God asks, to take, asks us to take pay cuts, Right? Sometimes God leads us to the barren place. Not all storms come from the evil one. It wasn't Satan who told them to get into the boat knowing the storm would come in Mark 4. It was Jesus. So you have access to so much information. You can read the blogs, listen to the podcasts, read the books. You have people come in. You have synergy. This is, this is awesome, but the, the challenge is, is we have access to so much information. And your ability to know what information to pay attention to and what information to ignore is significant. Because you're just bombarded. If I could give you a gift, it would be the gift of solitude. You know, when you pray in tongues, you practice mental solitude. The Bible says when you pray in, I pray in the Spirit and I can pray with the understanding. Understanding. 
Neuroscientists have studied the brain. When you speak in tongues, you use a part of the brain you seldom use, and you don't use the parts of your brain you always use. When you pray in tongues, try this. When you pray in tongues, try praying in tongues and reading the Bible at the same time. And how many of you know you're not, you are a spiritual being in a body. You don't have a body with the spirit. We're triune beings, right? Spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit who has a body. And when you die, your body becomes worm food. We receive a glorified body, whatever that means. And your spirit lives forever. And try praying in tongues and reading the Bible. Your brain can comprehend what you're reading, and yet you're praying in tongues. How do you do that? Because when you pray in tongues, you pray with the spirit, but you can also pray with the understanding. So when you pray in tongues, you practice a form of mental solitude. So when you pray in tongues, your brain disengages from all of the information you have access to. Could that be why Paul says, the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought? Could that be why Paul says, I pray in tongues more than all of you? So I'd encourage you to practice praying in tongues frequently. And it's not just so you can have power to preach, it's so that you can have power to unlearn what you think you know. And practice mental solitude so that you can come to this place where you can disengage from all of the information you're bombarded with so that you can hear the voice that, don't, that truly matters information and also opportunity you're swimming in a sea of opportunity and opportunities can seduce you they can seduce me we become successful at what does not matter and i'm telling you amidst all the information and opportunity you have access to what matters is preaching the gospel in context because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved it's the power of god and the gospel is enough when it is preached in context. You don't need to make the gospel relevant. The gospel is never relevant. It never makes sense to stand up and talk about a Jewish guy who died on a cross a couple thousand years ago for the sins of the world. That doesn't make sense. People don't even know what that means anymore, but it doesn't need to make sense because there's a power when we preach the gospel. And so we say, there's a man whose name was Jesus and he lived a life you could not live and he died a death you could not die and he died for the sins of the world and we actually use Bible language and it's okay to say the word sin because it's not a weakness, it's not a mistake, it's a sin. Jesus didn't die for our weaknesses, did he? He died for our sins and we preach the gospel and even if it makes no sense to talk about a guy who died on the cross, we talk about a guy who died on the cross and he was resurrected on the third day and he ever lives to make intercession for the saints because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved it is the power of God and the gospel makes no sense to anybody who has a modern mind who's swimming in a sea of information and opportunity and that could very well be the reason why God asks us to go into all the world and preach the gospel because you're not smart enough and you're not a good enough communicator to reason with somebody who's spiritually dead. Because dead people don't think and dead people don't feel. And Jesus didn't come to quote Tim Keller to make bad people good. He came to make spiritually dead people come alive. And the only thing that makes spiritually dead people come alive is the gospel. The gospel when preached in context. Okay, So we must become good at learning and not necessarily good at knowing. I can't remember his name. This quote isn't original with me. It's from somebody, and I can't remember his name. It's, it's skipping me. But this guy once said, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully prepared to inherit a world that no longer exists. Learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully prepared to inherit a world that no longer exists what I'm going to say about this when it comes to biblical literacy, and this is on the screen behind me, that truth transmutes in culture. What do I mean by that? I don't mean that God changes. I don't mean that truth changes. What I do mean is truth is fluid, and it fills whatever container it's placed in. So if I pick up this red cup that we all drink our sweet tea in, or if I pick up this clear bottle that I have my water in, if I pour sweet tea into this container... Now, we all know if there's poison in here, it contaminates it. But if I pour sweet tea into the red Dixie cup, or if I pour sweet tea into this 
untainted container, it fills whatever container it's placed in without its form being, without its substance being changed. Its form changes, but its substance does not. That's what I mean when I say there's a relativism to the gospel. Let me give you some examples. Abram. God speaks to Abram. Abram was not a Jew. Abram was a Gentile. Abram was an Iraqi male who lived in Ur of Chaldea. Side note, a good friend of mine, a biblical archaeologist, he helped excavate the ruins in Ur of Chaldea, and he told me that the average home in ancient Ur had 13 rooms. You got 13 rooms in your house? Me neither. How many of you know that's a big house? So when you think of Abraham looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, I want, I want to remind you it's very likely Abram was not a poor guy who lived in a tent. If Abram was average in Ur of Chaldea, he lived in a lucrative home. And God speaks not to a Hebrew male, he speaks to a Gentile and says, I want you to go to a land I will show you. Where are we going, God? Not telling. Okay, come on, sweetie, let's go. Where are we going, honey? I have no idea. And so they pick up everything and they start wandering into the middle of nowhere. Abram, who's not a Jew, he's a Gentile, he leaves Ur of Chaldea and he moves into the desert. And Abram becomes known as a group of his, he be, joins a community of people that were known as Hapiru. A word that means the dusty ones. They were called the dusty ones because they lived on the other side of the wall and the dust from the desert would cover their face and their eyebrows. And whenever they walked into the city, Ur of Chaldea, everybody would look at them and they were covered with dust and they would say, the dusty ones, Hapiru, where we get the word Hebrew. All, all Jews were Hebrew. Not all Hebrews were Jews. There were other Hebrews who were not Jewish people. Hebrews were people who lived in the desert who were covered by dust. That means that there were Hebrew slaves in Egypt that were not God's chosen people. And yet God emancipated the Hebrews and some of the people got grafted in. That's a pretty cool thought. So Abram's a Gentile. He becomes a Hebrew. By the time they leave ancient Egypt during the Exodus, what are they called? Israelites. They're no longer looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Now they're identified with the nation, the nation of Israel. By the time you come to the book of Esther, what are they called? They're no longer Israelites. They're called Jews. A slang term for people from the land of Judah because when a Persian would say the word Jew, they had to spit on the ground to get the word out. It was an insult. It would be like somebody calling you a redneck or somebody calling you fill in the blank. Okay? To be called a Jew was insulting. They go from being a Gentile to being a Hebrew to being Israelite to being a Jew. What's the point? The point is the truth is this. God has a community of people for himself on the earth. But depending upon what culture they live in and what time in history they live in, the way culture understood that truth changed. Gentile, Hebrew, Israelite, Jew. It's the same truth. God has a community of people. And today, what is his community of people called? The church. That's an example of how truth transmutes into culture. Let me give you another example. Jonah. Remember the ancient prophet Jonah, who does not want to go to Nineveh. He walks into Nineveh after he's swallowed by a fish. He's been in the belly of the fish for three days. The New Testament tells us he's a type of Christ, which actually means he dies in the belly of the fish. And I would suggest he's resurrected, or else he's not a real type of Christ. He gets puked up by the fish, and he walks into ancient Nineveh, and he preaches, and he's not interested. He didn't even want to go. He preaches a mamby-pamby sermon, and the whole city's converted. And what I found out is the Ninevites worship a fish god. So the prophet shows up in the city smelling like two-week-old tuna nuda casserole, and everybody gets saved. He's covered in fish puke. Now we know why Jonah wasn't swallowed by a giant hippopotamus. They didn't worship a hippopotamus god. They worshiped a fish god. That's an example of how truth transmutes in culture. Gospel of John. The first three miracles in the Gospel of John are directly related to the three gods that they worshipped in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is the region the writer of John is writing to. 
and I wrote them down so I didn't forget. I'm not this smart. I just wrote them down. Let me read it to you. The first three miracles in John are directly related to these gods. Dionysius, who is the god who turned the water into wine. They worshipped a god named Dionysius whose mir miracle was to turn water into wine. They worshipped a second god, Asclepius, who was the god of healing. And then they worshipped a goddess named Demeter, who was the goddess of bread. The first three miracles Jesus performs in Asia Minor are directly related to the three deities they worship. What's the writer of John saying? He's saying what it takes three gods to do, Jesus can do. Truth tran transmutes into culture. There are times when certain truths are more relevant based on the culture that you're in. Are you with me? Okay, let me give you a few more. Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy is patterned after treaties, legal treaties that were common in its day. Mark's gospel is arranged based on the coronation events of Caesar. So anybody reading Mark's gospel would have understood that the writer is saying Caesar, even though they used to worship Caesar as God, the writer is saying Caesar is not God, Jesus is. I'll stop here for the sake of time. What does it look like for truth to transmute into culture today? Let me give you just one example, okay? So I've got a full-time job. I've got a job. I'm not, in, I'm not a youth pastor right now. I work at Convoy of Hope, but I'm still the next-gen guy for the World AG. But I still speak to a lot of teenagers. I like students. But I am who I am. And I just decided whether I'm... Speaking to leaders, I'm speaking to students. Those of you who have been a part of the camps I've been a part of, you understand that what you get is with Heath is what you get. I don't change who I am based on my audience. I just found that God doesn't anoint who we pretend to be. He anoints who we are. And so let me give you an example of how truth transmutes in culture. This worked in Los Angeles at a youth conference with 7,000 Latino young people. This worked in New York at a youth conference with 2,000 um, and the audience was very diverse, and it worked at a music festival with 100,000 people, almost all of whom do not come from a Pentecostal background. I began to experiment. When I talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I don't know what comes to your mind, and listen, I am as Pentecostal as they come. I was delivered from a bunch of stuff because I had an encounter with Jesus, and I am lovesick for a revival. And I want to see heaven crack open on the earth. And I want to see it rain down. And I want to see, um, I want to make sure that we don't follow signs and wonders, but they should follow us. And if they don't follow us, we need to ask why. So if I were to say, hey, there's something called the promise of the Father. God wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Who wants prayer? Maybe the, the, the model would be, okay, I want you to come forward. I'm going to lay my hand on you and pray for you. And people would speak in tongues. I am all for that. All for that. But when you're in an, a music festival with 100,000 people, and they don't even know what you're talking about, they're not a part of our Assemblies of God community, and you don't have time to unpack it, and you can't call everybody forward and lay hands on people, what do you do? How do you preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit in front of 100,000 people and you can't call them forward and lay hands on them? Well, let me share with you something I've been experimenting with that I've seen good results with, and this is an example of how truth transmutes into culture. How many of you would like God to be your dad? There are over 8,000 promises in the Bible. There's only one promise called the promise of the Father. How many of you would like God to be your dad? Hands up all over the place. Would you like to talk to your dad in a special way that only you and your dad understand? Yeah, let's pray. Seen thousands of people at a music festival, at an event in Southern California, at an event in New York, baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. They didn't know they were supposed to speak in tongues. All they knew is, I want God to be my dad. And I want to talk to my dad in a special way. Uh, right? How many of you know that's the same thing as they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in new tongues. That's the same thing, but they don't know that. They just know is there's a promise of the Father. Okay? Identity. If I was the devil and I wanted to destroy 
God's purpose, I would think long and hard about how to do it. So by the time you come, I'm giving you an example of how truth transmutes into culture right now. So if I was the devil and I wanted to destroy God's purpose, I would think long and hard about how to do it. So what does the serpent do when he comes up in the garden? Remember this. You've, you've memorized this passage. You've preached on this. He comes. Did God really say, don't eat the fruit from that tree, right? What does the evil one do? He casts doubt on who God is. He casts doubt on who they are. Did God really say he cast doubt on God's word? We know God's word is synonymous with God's character. How do we know that? It's what the Bible says. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh made his dwelling place, place among us. If you want to know what God is like, read the Bible, right? So he cast doubt on God's word, and then he cast doubt on who they are. He says to the man and to the woman, side note, he does, God does not create Adam and Eve. God creates Adam. How do we know that? It says so in the Bible. Genesis 5.1, in the beginning God created them, male and female, God created them. God called their name Adam. God does not create Adam and Eve. He creates Adam. The man and the woman. There was such a unity between the husband and the wife. God would say, come here, Adam, and the man and the woman would come. Who gives the woman the name Eve? The man does. And ironically, Eve means mother of the living, and it comes from a root word that means snake. So for the rest of her life, every time she hears her name, half of her identity comes from God, half of it comes from the evil one, the one who was there in the garden. God knows if you eat the fruit from that tree, you'll be like God, and they were already like God. They were already made in his image. Now we know how the evil one sees God. For God knows if you eat that fruit, you'll be like God. And what happened to them? They were naked and ashamed. I would suggest that that's how Lucifer views God. He thinks God is naked and ashamed. If I was the devil and I wanted to destroy God's purpose, I would think long and hard about how to do it. He does not send an assassin into the garden. He does not send a prostitute or a drug dealer in to distract the man or the woman. He seeks to cast doubt on their identity. Let's go to Matthew 4. What does the evil one try to do to distract Jesus from the purpose of God? Does he bring a heroin dealer in front of Jesus? Does he bring a prostitute? Does he try to assassinate Jesus? No. What does he do? He tries to cast doubt on the identity of Jesus. If you're really the son of God, wait a second. Didn't Jesus just hear the father say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased? Yes, he did. And we know that the evil one would have heard that. If you're really the son of God, do this. If I was the evil one, I would think long and hard about how to distract Jesus from his purpose. And we see that the same strategy was identity. The same strategy he used in the garden with Adam and Eve. In Jude 20, what do you do when you pray in tongues? When you pray in the Spirit, you build yourself up in your most holy faith. You don't build up who you pretend to be. You don't build up who people think you are. You build up yourself. So maybe when you preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, maybe the power we receive in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, maybe there's power in knowing who you really are. So when, when you tie the baptism in the Holy Spirit to identity and the heart of the Father, I've seen amazing results. That's an example of how truth transmutes into culture. Okay, that's what I mean by that. Moving on. So let me ask you a question. What what exists in our culture today and how would Jesus address these issues? Let me just throw a few out. How would Jesus address the issue of civil rights? How would Jesus address the issue of racism? How would Jesus address immigration? How would Jesus address bullying? How would Jesus address the social effects of pornography? Who is Jesus to a junior high girl who was molested by her uncle? Who is Jesus to the junior boy in high school whose dad used to be in ministry and had to get out because of depression and burnout? Who is Jesus and you fill in the blank, okay? So there are truths in God's word that will fill whatever container it's placed in, right? Okay, that's what I mean by biblical literacy and spiritual literacy. Biblical literacy is related to spiritual literacy, and I want to give you an example in Acts chapter 2 of how this takes place. In Acts chapter 2, remember they were all together in one accord. The place that they were in was shaken. There was a sound like a rushing mighty wind and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, right? What happens after that? 
Were they hyper-emotional? Were they hyper-spiritual? Were they crazy charismatics and pathetic Pentecostals? No. God was in charge of that experience 100%. That was God, right? Are we all on the same page there? They weren't faking it. They weren't being hyper-emotional. God lit their head on fire. There's an earthquake in the church service. A tornado blows through that place. And you're from Oklahoma. You understand tornadoes. And they speak in tongues. And what happens? Everybody says these people are drunk out of their minds. And not only are they drunk, they're drunk on new wine. Which is hilarious because the grape harvest won't occur for another month. There was no new wine yet. They're drunk on new wine, and they're criticized. The first thing that happens after they're filled with the Holy Spirit is they're criticized. And what does Peter do? He addresses the criticism. Evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit is your ability and willingness to be misunderstood for the sake of the gospel. To be misunderstood for something that God is 100% responsible for that people may not understand. People may not understand some of the reasons why you believe what you believe. People may not understand why you take a stand on marriage the way you do. And evidence that we're Pentecostal is we have the courage and the ability to take a stand for what's right, even if people don't understand. Acts chapter 2. And they ask the question, what does this mean? And what does Peter do? Remember this. Peter stands up and he says, they're not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So let me stop here. What happened in the upper room? There's an earthquake. There's a sound like a wind. God lights their head on fire and they speak in tongues. And what does Peter say this is that? That is Joel chapter 2. Remember what it says in Joel chapter 2. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. Sons and daughters will prophesy. So in the upper room, you've got tongues, wind, fire, shaking. In Joel chapter 2, you've got dreams, visions, and prophecy. And Peter says this is that. This doesn't look anything like that. Tongues, wind, fire, shaking doesn't look anything like dreams, visions, and prophecy. And Peter says, this is the same thing as that. Peter was able to align his heart and his mind with something that he didn't have language for yet. That's what I mean when I say biblical literacy is related to spiritual literacy. Because to stand up and say, this is that, makes absolutely no sense because this doesn't look anything like that. But when you know God, and when you're in tune with what God's doing, you can say with confidence, this is that, even if this doesn't look anything like that. Okay. In Acts chapter 2, they were obedient before they had the language nailed down. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament then. They were obedient before they had the language nailed down. Do you need to have the language nailed down before you're obedient? They were obedient before they had the language nailed down. Let me give you some practical suggestions, okay? When you're preaching, what I would say is this. When it comes to biblical literacy, what I would say is this. When you're preaching the Word of God to your students, number one, I would encourage you to take time to model how you studied the Bible to come up with whatever it is you're saying. I would encourage you to give them notes. Dan Betzer, he's an Assemblies of God pastor in Florida. I was talking to him a few months ago. This is what he's doing on Wednesday nights. He will give everybody between 20 and 30 pages of notes when they leave church just so that they can go home and continue to study what he talked about. He pastors one of the largest churches in our, in our fellowship, and he's still devoting himself to make sure that people understand how to study the Bible for themselves, right? The people you preach to, and you know this, the people you preach to are biblically illiterate. They don't know the Word. So it's important to understand that we model how we study the Bible when we stand up and communicate to people. I would spend a third of the time talking about the history and the context. I would spend less time talking about how to apply it to their life. If you're like me, you were taught that when you write a sermon, you open with a good story, you have a few points, you end with a sappy story of a little kid with a red ball dying on train tracks, and then you give everybody five life application steps. I would suggest we want to unlearn that. 
because now in our culture, kids do not think in a linear fashion. They don't. The sermon outline was put into practice during the 40s when culture was mobilized to fight in the Second World War. And it was all about didactic, one step after another. There's so much evidence out there. The young people in our youth ministries, their brains have been rewired. They don't think in a linear fashion. They think like this. It's crazy. That's why they can sit there with their phone, and they're talking to you, and then all of a sudden, you're like, are you even listening to me? And they somehow are listening to you, even though they're playing Candy Crush. Right? It's because their brains are working a bit different, and we can use that to our advantage. As a matter of fact, we have to. So let's throw away the outline, and instead, I would, I would suggest that you preach with a narrative style. Your first third is you model, this is the history, this is the context, this is what it meant. And then, this is what it means. And instead of giving them five ways to apply it to their life, let the Holy Spirit come and apply it to their life for them. I'm convinced that sometimes we do the Holy Spirit a disservice because we, tr we commit linguistic idolatry and we try to package everything God is doing in our life application steps. And nobody's smart enough to know how to speak to a group of 25 or 25,000 teenagers and dumb down, this is how you apply this to your life. It's impossible. So instead, what I'm, what I'm doing, I may not be a youth pastor, but I speak to a lot of young people is just give space for the Holy Spirit to talk. Like 60 seconds of silence. Isn't that awkward? Take 60 seconds of silence and just say nothing. And watch the Holy Spirit will speak to them. And then in your small groups, hey, what came to you during those 60 seconds? You'll be amazed at what happens. You'll be amazed. And so that would be an example of how I would tweak my preaching. That's what I've done, okay? Um... I would unpack also the hist how um, the accuracy of the history behind what you're saying, and I would give them sources. I know it sounds like I'm suggesting you give a college lecture. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is they fact check everything you say. And I would also encourage you to stop using commentaries that were written by Americans in the 50s when you do your sermon prep. Because th there is this huge conversation out there. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's this huge conversation out there where people look at our missions efforts and they think it is a warped version of capitalism and colonialism. Like there are people who actually think it is unjust to go to another country and preach the gospel because you disrupt and disturb their native indigenous culture. Now, we would say, you know what? Hey, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. But a lot of our young people are listening to teachers in high school and junior high school and their parents and they're watching the movies and they really believe that, right? So they're, they're, the, the historical accuracy of what you're talking about, I would give them sources and I would de-Americanize what you're saying. Let me give you a few things, maybe a few starting points, okay? Okay. Um, there's a book called The Desire of the Everlasting Hills. I would suggest you read that. Written by a guy named Thomas Cahill. It's called The Desire of the Everlasting Hills. He's a believer. I think he's pretty sure he's gone on to be with Jesus. But this book is about what the culture was like at the time of Christ. It is fascinating. And when you read it, you're, you'll realize, read the book and then Go to the bibliography in the back and read a few others. But that's a book that completely revolutionized how I began to study to speak to teenagers. Um, so that's a starting point. And then a, one more book, it's a bit hard to understand, but it's worth reading anyway, is called um, The Sage from Galilee. Uh, why did Jesus say what he said? Remember, Jesus, his disciples were primarily adolescents and teenagers. If you look at how Jesus communicated to his teenagers, he asked questions and he told fictitious stories called parables. 
He was a prolific storyteller, and he asked questions. So when I'm speaking to teenagers, I will open up. I don't, I've never been good about getting out there and saying thank you to people anyway. I'm not a funny person, and so I'm not good with videos. I can't stand media because I forget half the time what I put on the slides, and I have to turn around and stare at the screen. So what I found what works for me is I will walk out and tell one story, and then I will share one concept verse by verse through a passage. That's it. And I will find Jesus in the text. I will find Jesus in the text. And guys, the number one question I get after I speak to students, there's a line of students and the number, I've started keeping track of their questions. The number one question I get by far is, how did you learn that and how can I learn more? How did you learn that? It happened a couple years ago when I was at Oklahoma's camp, whenever that was. It happens consistently in the local church, in universities, music festivals, wherever it may be. The number one question, how did you learn that? What, what is that telling you? That's telling you that they're, they're, they're wanting to understand how, how can I know that the story of Jesus is real and authentic, and how can I interact with the authentic Jesus, right? So anyway, there's that. The gospel is enough when preached in context. Historicity is crucial when preaching. I already covered that. Demonstrate how to rightly divide the word of truth. I, I already covered that. And then one last thing, and then I'm going to be done because I'll end at 1.30 like I'm supposed to this time, and we'll open it up. Guys, um, I got saved in the most, and some of you have heard this, but I'm going to share it again. I got saved in the most dysfunctional youth service you can fathom. I did not know God, and I walked into a youth group with about 20 teenagers. They were sitting in a circle. The police were there. I walked in wearing my Grateful Dead t-shirt with a big pot leaf on the front. I hadn't slept in four nights. I walk in, and what happened is, is the local church, the Assemblies of God pastor, had to kick a family out of their church because the lady got mad and told somebody she was going to kill them. So I show up, and people are screaming at one another. People are crying, and the police are in the room. They're having a family meeting, and Heath comes to church. I'm the guy who's talking to demons, and I'm moving chairs across the floor with my eyeballs. I'm walking into a youth group, and there is no story sappy enough to get me. There is no sermon outline where all the points start with P, the power, the purpose, the presence, the promise, right? I'm all for that. How many of you remember the days where all your points had to start with the same letter? Aren't you glad that somebody decided that's no longer necessary, <gasps> right? And so I walk in, and there is no sermon that night. They're having a family meeting, and they're arguing in their church for an hour and a half. And the volunteer youth leader, who was a truck driver, his son said, Heath is here. You've got to give an altar call, Dad. So after the family meeting is over, and Officer Willie, one of the cops, who I knew personally, because of my background, everybody, bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm convinced nobody closed their eyes except me. Everybody had their hands on their wallets because they knew this guy who's in our youth group is unsafe. And I closed my eyes. There was no worship. There was no sermon. The gospel was shared. I had never read the Bible before. I did not know John 3.16. John 3.16 is what people write on cardboard and hold up at football games. That's what I thought. And I raised my hand. Innocent enough to believe. If I raise my hand, because the preacher asked me to, I can find out if God really so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that's when God got a hold of me. That's it. His name's Kurt, Kurt Forney. You'll probably never invite Kurt Forney to come talk. Never. It's not because he's a bad guy. People just don't know who he is. He works a full-time job at a factory. A couple days ago, I'm in India. And I meet a guy. If I was a good communicator, I'd have the picture on the screen behind me. I meet a guy who's a chemistry teacher who taught Sunday school in the same church for decades. And one of the little rugrats 
who was in a Sunday school class, who he led to Jesus, is now David Mohan, the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in India and the vice chairman for the World Assemblies of God Fellowship. You'll probably never know the name of this chemistry Sunday school teacher, but you know his fruit. You'll never know Kurt Forney's name, but you know his fruit. And he dared to believe if I share the gospel in context, the gospel's enough. So when you preach, you may not be an eloquent communicator. You don't need to be. Because the greatest communicator in the universe is never on the cover of your poster for youth convention. His name is the Holy Spirit. The greatest communicator in the universe is here. And he is talking to your heart. And he is saying stuff to you that I'm not even saying. And if you get anything out of this today, it's not because I've said it. It's because the Holy Spirit has been having a conversation with you. And you know that the same thing happens when you talk to students in your small group, in your Sunday school classroom, your Wednesday night, your Sunday, when you have them over at your house, when you go to the Piggly Wiggly, when you go to Bebop's and get a cheeseburger after you service. And there's a conversation that's going on with that young person. And the Holy Spirit, the best communicator in the universe, is communicating to them in a language they understand. And all we have to do, I really believe, all we have to do is share the gospel. Because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, being saved, the Holy Spirit, the active agent in salvation, no one comes to the Father, the Bible says, unless the Spirit draws him. That means people don't decide when they get right with God. The Holy Spirit initially draws them, and then they respond. Then they choose. What God uses is the gospel. So preach the gospel in context. The gospel is Genesis to Revelation. Model how to study the Bible. Make sure that if you say something, it's historically accurate. Make sure that it is not just, and I'm not down on American Christianity, but make sure it's not the American version of, And share the word of God, the gospel in context, and you watch the Holy Spirit do what he does. And whether your youth group grows to 5,000 or you hover at 25, don't worry about that. Be who you are. Let God anoint who you are. Preach the gospel in context and love those teenagers with all of your heart. Because even if you have a dysfunctional youth service, like the one I got saved in, I'm telling you what, God was there. And the reason why God was there is because God's people were there. And wherever you go, God goes. And when you share the gospel, that empowers and equips the voice of the Holy Spirit to thunder in the heart and the soul of every single person who hears it. And if I could give a gift to every single leader, not just youth leader, but every single faith-based church leader in America, it would be to trust that the gospel is enough. It's enough. And we preach it, and even more so, we demonstrate it, right? People walk into our youth rooms, and we, we say hi to them. People walk into our churches and they don't sit in quiet desperation. Have you ever felt alone in church? Am I the only person? Right? To where when we talk about we need community, okay, yeah, we need community. But ultimately, we need community with him. Right? So when it comes to biblical literacy, I gave you some practical tips. Biblical literacy is closely tied to spiritual literacy. And the only way you can say this is that, even when this doesn't look anything like that, is to make sure that you not only study the Bible, but you're friends with the Holy Spirit. That's ultimately where it comes from. So I'm going to stop here four minutes early, Pastor Heath. I want to make that clear. Four minutes early.